Good afternoon. My name's Hamish Belton from HealthCert, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, webinar this year for 2020 on medical business. This evening, we have the founder and CEO of HealthCert and National Skin Cancer Centres, Paul Elmsley, and his presentation will be on a, do you have an exit strategy for your medical practice? We expect the webinar to run for 20 to 25 minutes for Paul's presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, you're welcome to enter your questions as you go. In the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a little section called questions. If you drop that down, you can type them in. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll talk through those with Paul, and you're welcome to give, uh, make additional, ask additional questions. So with that, we'll get started. So welcome, Paul. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, and I do appreciate it. And we're going to be talking about different exit strategies for your medical practice. Um, I thought what I might do is just quickly give you a little bit of a sort of background, just because, you know, probably why I'm able to give you some level of advice on this. Um, and realistically, from my perspective, is that I was in a position um, uh, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, built a group of practices, um, had an unfortunate incident on sort of the exit of that, which I'll share a little bit later. Um, set up Health Cert and then in 2009 got back into practices. So I think that, and as many of you will probably be familiar with me, uh, having been in the industry for 20 years, I've helped you know support and build practices for others and help give them advice. And and having an MBA and also done an entrepreneurial masters at MIT, um, I've got a fairly good understanding of, of sorry, how the business world works and how all these systems and processes can uh, be. So I'm just keen to, to share that with you. Now. I'm going to assume that, you know, the reason that you're here today is because your current situation looks a little bit like this. You've obviously worked very hard to create something valuable. So, so the practice you have, particularly if you've started it from scratch or even if you've taken over from somebody else, you know, it's taken a lot of work. I mean, this is not just something that just magically happens. Um, setting up practices, finding good people, you know, managing patients, um, finding doctors. I mean, all these things obviously take a lot of time and effort. I think that also, I've also experienced that for, for most business owners, they are emotionally attached. I mean, it is their baby. So this is something which you've poured your heart and soul into. It is something which really is uh, matters to you. So I'm just conscious of that. It's just not some innate object. It's something which has a lot of blood, sweat and tears involved. The other thing is that typically most of the practices I deal with, they, they care about their team. So in other words, the doctors and the staff, so, you know, they're part of your family and part of your wider group. And, you know, whatever you choose to do going in the future, if you look towards exit, is, you know, you want to make sure they're going to a good place and they're going to be looked after uh, in that process. Now, for the most part, what I've traditionally found is, you know, most practice owners, when they're looking at exit, effectively are transitioning from, I've been a full-time doctor, because you're typically the primary breadwinner or the main doctor at the practice, and you're the business owner. So besides being a full-time doctor, you've also then dealing with HR issues and working with the practice managers, you know, accountants, lawyers, all of that sort of stuff. And you sort of got to a point where you're saying, look, that's been a great journey and it's been a lot of fun, but I would like to have a path to wind down. And typically for most doctors, winding down means, you know, going from full-time and business owner to maybe full-time to part-time, you know, four days a week, three days a week, with eventual plan to sort of retirement. But with Paul, the goal of that, Paul, all of that... Paul, sorry, it's Hamish here. I just stuck on your first slide. I'm just not sure, wanted to confirm if you've moved on or not. Um, I'm not sure have, what's happened in our testing. I'm okay. still seeing the opening slide, which is, do you have an exit strategy? Yep, let me just, sorry, excuse me, everyone. If I, let me go out of it and I'll come back into it and see what we can do. Is that looking a bit better? No, that's the same. I've actually got you showing up twice in the uh, uh, in the dashboard here. Okay. Um, I'll be very honest, I'm just saying I'm not sure how I can. What's happening? Uh, let me just. Um, make just make make me the. Yep. All right. Sorry. Now we've done. All right. Now we're seeing your current situation. You have worked hard to All create right. something. Um, and we also didn't have, at the same time, we lost your video. So uh, if you want to okay. enable that and we'll be uh, on track. 
Yeah. I'm not sure that everyone does want to see me, to be honest. But anyway, thank you for sharing that particular situation. Um, no worries. Wonderful. All right. The joys of technology. So um, just once again, reiterating those, those key points that I was just sharing with you. Um, and so, so from that process of transition, so ultimately, as I said, looking from the perspective of, um, you know, shifting from full time to part time. Um, the other thing that we do see is, you know, you want to get a fair reward for the effort. So in other words, you know, I do, I have created something of value. It is worth something. And I want to get a fair dollar for that, you know, so that's another consideration. So all in all, generally what I find is that doctors getting later in their career, or let's say not enjoying the job of running the practice as well as being a full-time doctor, and want to look to move to the next stage, which is realizing the value of the asset they've created, being the practice, but still having a role in the practice. Now, typically, most people aren't looking to sell and then stop the next day. Um, typically when you sell, there's generally a requirement to sort of hang around for a bit anyway, um, and normally that's the case. So normally it's a case of winding down. So, you know, once again, remove the business owner part, move into um, that process. Now, when you're looking at um, the reasons for, 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 uh, to, for exit and also the things to consider, it really comes down to this. How quickly do you want to exit and how? So. I'm going to talk about methods of exit in a minute, but what I'm just conscious of is, you know, do I need to leave immediately because I've got a health issue and I need to get out of the practice today? It might be I would like to leave over the next two years, so I just want to build out a plan and really understand my options. So everyone's going to have a different um, reason for doing it and time, right, depending on, once again, where you're at with your career or your plans. Or it could be external forces. You know, my, my partner is having to go through cancer treatment. I want to be there for them. So everyone's going to have a different reason as to why they want to exit and how that would be. One of the other key elements of considering also is that from my experience with doctors is your clinical independence. So in other words, you being a doctor, being able to make your own decisions is generally very important, right? Now, with some of the options we'll talk about later as far as exit, some of your clinical options might be limited, okay, and as far as they will want you to send the pathology to a particular place, or you're going to have to work particular hours or do particular things. So, um, you know, once again, when you go through, I suppose, the different options, you need to understand what is the impact, because one thing is I'm going to get paid a dollar, but what else is it I'm going to have to do um, to fulfill those obligations? The other thing to consider, of course, is your team and what will happen to them. So are they going to get swallowed up by a big organisation? Are they going to be supported? Are they going to be retained? Uh, you know, there's lots of different um, things to consider, um, you know, with, uh, with your team going forward. And there's also top dollar versus good dollar. And let me sort of try and explain that. Now, if it's all about money, then you just take the highest dollar off it, right? If you don't care about who you work for, uh, what's happening to your team, what's happening to the practice, then you would do that. Then there is what I call good dollar. So in other words, it's good money, but the other terms and conditions are much more favorable or more, or, you know, things that I would like to see. So it really depends. If, if you want to just sell it, get out, you know, then leave the next day, or you take the top dollar and you probably, you know, that doesn't matter. Whether you, if you wanted to sell it and then stay on, then you need to once again have that as a consideration. Now, one of the other things, of course, is timing and tax consideration. So is it going into a self-managed super fund? Has it been drawn down, um, you know, as a capital gain? There's all of these sorts of elements that, you know, you need to get independent tax advice. But, you know, I'm just conscious that also could be something which might be a consideration for you, depending on your age and where you're at. Um, and the key thing is also is who you're going to be working with in the future. Now, any form of, um, you know, it's a bit like getting married because typically when you sell your practice, you're still going to be required to, to hang around and work with, you know, the organisation or, or whoever it is. It could be whether you sell it to the other doctors in the practice or whatever the different options are, which I'm about to share with you. So it, it's a bit like a marriage. I mean, you really want to be comfortable that who you're going to be in the bed with for the next, you know, one, two, five years, whatever it happens to be, is somebody who you're comfortable with and has a shared core value alignment and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, that's another consideration is who am I going to be working with, you know, particularly in the future. Now, your options for, for sale really come down to this. 
there's an outright sale, i.e. I will sell the business, get 100% of the cash today or whatever that looks like and pass on the ownership. Does that make sense? So was owner, no longer owner. It's pretty much the sort of variation. There's a thing called a sale with an earn out. So let's what sale with an earn out is, is, is along the lines of this. I'll sell the business and agree to sell the business and let's say it's worth, you know, let's use $100, right? But you might only get, let's say, 70 of those dollars, but then you're required to hang around and make sure the practice still makes a certain amount of money. And then I get my other 30%, you know, in two or three years time. So that's what an earn out is, where you get some of the money. I mean, the sale is guaranteed, but the, it's valued at one point now. And then depending on how it's performing in the future, would then de determine what the second payment typically is. Now, one of the challenges with that is, of course, the practice could grow, but of course, the practice also could go backwards. And if you're not running it, then you have less control of that. Um, so, you know, it, that's a sort of bit more riskier option, um, but it is obviously another option. The other one is, is selling a minority percentage. So in other words, I'd sell 30% to somebody else, and we'll talk about who those somebody else could be, um, and then I still retain a majority, right? Now, the, the issue with that sometimes can be, well, you've sold it to them, but then who's got decision-making control? I mean, you know, what if you want it to be black and someone else wants it to be white? How's that going to be managed as such? And this comes into the play, same thing if you sell a majority share. So let's say, for example, you sell 60% of your company, and this is something which happened to me back in the early 2000s, um, sold a, percent, a majority percentage. So in other words, I'm still a part owner, but I don't control the business at all. Like I can't, I'm, you know, I can be gazumped on every decision related to that. So the, the, the sale of, of a minority percentages or a majority percentages have elements of risk because now it's a shared decision-making model. And depending on how that shared decision-making model is created, uh, and it comes then into the finer details. I mean, this is the challenge with sale contracts, the devil's in the detail. And you know, typically most companies will make sure that the wording is obviously in their favor. And you know, there's a lot of back and forth typically with lawyers to understand it. Um, but it really, once again, comes down to what you want to do. If it is a case of, I just like to exit the practice, get paid and become a doctor, or I want to sort of you know, have some sort of minority or majority shareholding going forward. And I said, look, and I, and I think one of the other key things is with all of those sorts of deals is also working out you know, who you're working with and the future and certainty of the deal. So for example, if I was to sell a percentage of my business with somebody saying they're then gonna buy the rest of my business in the future, what's the certainty of that occurring? So imagine if that company fell over or something else, you might not get that extra 30% as a result of it. So once again, with all of these sort of different options, there's degrees of certainty or, or risk, you know, and there's also reward attached to it. So it depends whether you're risk adverse and want certainty or you're prepared to sort of, you know, punt on it and see how it goes. And once again, very happy to help uh, people in individual situations. Now, um, who can you sell to, right? So who are you, what are your options? The number one thing you could do, or one of the options, is sell to your existing doctors or new doctors. So let's say you're in a practice and there's three doctors in the practice You've decided, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, what could happen is you could then choose to um, sell it to uh, the doctors within the practice, right? So how about you buy it off me and, you know, either pay me the lump sum or pay me over time, right? So that's one option is to sell to the doctors within the practice. There's a thing called an MBO, very rare to see in medicine, but it's not unheard of. And a management buyout is, is the practice manager and or some of the staff or staff and doctors buy the practice off you. So this sort of, it's a similar thing to the first thing about, you know, doctors within your practice buying the practice off you. Um, the other one is then a management buyout. Now, once again, both of these deals typically are a dollar up front and then pay me over time because for the most part, they probably don't have access to, you know, the lump sum that you might want for the practice. Now, the banks might lend them money on it, but typically banks are not very keen to lend money uh, on businesses because it's high risk. So, you know, banks are very shy on lending money for shares and businesses because, you know, it, it can obviously go south. Very happy to lend money for property because they've obviously got a physical asset um, that they can sell if you get into trouble. 
The next one is a corporate medical company. So this is a, a corporate. So this is a you know typically a public company. Um, it's got shareholders, um, you know, but it's in the medical field. So um, typically, you know, long-term players. Um, now, with you know all organisations, you obviously got to look at you know what's their motive. I mean, look, every business has a profit motive, right? We have to make at least one dollar to keep the doors open, right? So let's not you know beat around the bush. Everybody, someone needs to make a dollar, and particularly if they're buying your business. They obviously, if they're paying you a dollar for it, they want to get a dollar ten for it or a dollar twenty. Uh, no, at least, right? Because otherwise, what's the point of doing it? So you've got corporate medical companies uh, who are in the market to buy practices. You then have private equity or venture capital, but private equity, as you know it. Now, private equity um, typically are organisations who have obviously been able to get some money off some people that want to invest in healthcare. They go around and will then look to buy up assets. You know, whether it's you know, clinics or other sort of health-related assets, pull them all together and then resell it back to the market at a higher dollar. So they're typically looking to obviously, same thing, you know, get a dollar and then turn it into another dollar, um, but generally have a more of a short-term view, whereas a lot of the corporate medical companies, you know, have been around for a long time, not all of them, of course, um, but they're different um, sort of motivations in the sense that private equity definitely is looking at trying to get a dollar and turn it to another in a shorter time period. And one of the challenges with that is obviously when the asset is on sold, who is it being sold to? So you don't really know, you know who that is. Um, you know, and my sort of experience is that, um, uh, I'll share my experience a little bit later actually, I think probably a better way of doing it. Okay, and then the other option is a private medical company. So this is a private business. Um, so, you know, small company um, and, you know, looking at, you know, who they are, but let's say just a, a private business versus a corporate business, typically, the advantage probably of private companies are dealing with the individuals who are the owners, whereas you know typically in larger organisations there's many more players involved uh, and different steps and processes. But I think when you're looking at any of these options, you need to look at obviously who it is, the history, their motivations, and the certainty of delivering on what's promised. So for example, you know sometimes selling to the doctors or management, the risk is if they don't run the practice very well and or potentially goes broke you might not get the money for the asset you've created. Um, you know, and I think that for my mind is just, you know, you need to stand back and just look at who am I dealing with? You know, what is their history? You know, and whether level of success or otherwise, and why are they doing this? Like, what is their motivation as such? Now, the benefits or costs of selling now versus later, okay? So let's say I'm thinking about selling and I don't really know if I do want to sell or not, now, for everybody, it needs to be some part of your thinking, right? Whether it's today or tomorrow, you will need to realize the, asset, the, the value of your asset because you'll want to retire, right? Now, definitely selling it a little bit before you retire is worth a lot more than if you sell it the day before you're about to retire. Because ultimately, when a, someone's buying a practice, they're buying your practice's future earnings. So let's say, for example, your practice makes $100, right? And the value, the practice is valued at, let's say, four times. So it's worth $400. So if someone's buying the practice, they're paying you the $400 on the basis that in the future, it will deliver the profit to pay back that money and some on top. So if you can imagine, if you're going to sell it, then leave straight away, well, your part of that income disappears. So therefore, the practice is not worth four times. It might only be worth one or two times. So you need to factor that into the decision. Now, the other key thing to remember is that the, the benefits of selling now versus later is certainty versus uncertainty, okay? So let's say, for example, the practice today is worth, you know, let's say, let's say it's worth $400, right? Now, we know it's worth $400 today, and for a lot of practices, when I talk to them, they go, well, if we recruit another doctor or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, maybe it might be worth $500, you know, might be, it might grow for that. Now, that's possibly true, but imagine if you lost a doctor or two, you know, maybe now it's only worth $200. So that's one of those elements you need to consider is that, you know, we know what it's worth today. Yes, it might be worth more in, you know, let's say two, three, four years time, but it also might be worth less, right? And you need to think about that as a strategy. The other thing to also be bearing in mind is that what happens if you have a bulk billing clinic set up next door, right, and takes all your patients away? So it may not just be 
um, you maintaining the existing doctors or growing the doctors, there's external forces you cannot control. Right? Government can change the rules on what we're allowed to bill for. Um, you know, I'm not saying there's going to be a cure for skin cancer, but you know, there's a whole bunch of factors that could change the value of your business in the future in a negative sense. So there is certainty versus, well, let's just keep going and we'll see how it looks like in a few years' time. Now, the, one of the benefits of also selling now is let's say, for example, the practice is worth $400 and we want to then, you know, we might be able to make it worth 500 over time or maybe even six if we're lucky, right? Now, one of the options though is to take the money off the table now and then reinvest it into assets which are better for you for the long term. So for most part, when I'm talking to doctors, they're basically looking at it from the perspective of, I'm looking towards retirement, okay? So at, at some point in the future, I wanna wind down and potentially do nothing or very little or go fishing or go on long European holidays. If you take the money off the table and invest it properly, and I'm talking securely and particularly in property, um, you could take that, you know, that $500 or let's say it's 500,000, let's use that number, and over a 10 year period, if you took your practice as worth 500 and it grew as it normally is as an industry standard at about three and a half percent, it would be worth around about 600 to 650. If you were to take that 500 invested in property properly, at minimum it would grow to 2 million, right? So, but the other advantage of course, if let's say you invest in property, just as an example, is that it's a long-term strategy because the you know, property will go on for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, you know, it's an asset you can pass on to your children. It's something you can get a passive income from. So I think the key thing is that um, taking the money off the table of the practice, putting it into a different asset class, you can still be a doctor and earn an income, but at least the risk is taken away and it's in a long-term strategy um, that's not a, a risk. Now, I've got a guy by the name of Chris Gray, who's the Sky News uh, real estate. If you, you know, if you read any of the real estate stuff, Chris Gray is the guru with this stuff. I've asked him to put together a lecture specifically on property and obviously, you know, the value of compound interest. There's a whole bunch of stuff inside property, which to be honest with you, when I looked at it, was, you know, blew my mind. And I think that I've asked him to put something together specifically for doctors. Uh, we're getting it recorded next week and we'll send you through an invitation to have a look at that as well, because I think you'll find just even for yourself, even if it's a case of I've got, you know, a few dollars in the bank and want to look at my options. I mean, you can go into shares, but as we've just seen recently, they've just obviously nosedived thanks to the coronavirus. Uh, but property is a very safe asset class going forward and can have a much greater multiple than trying to just keep working at your practice. The other benefits, of course, is if you sell now, you lower the stress in your life. I don't have to deal with the human resource issues. I don't have to, you know, because what I find um, from most of my experience of dealing with doctors, it just wears you down eventually. You know, having to deal with the people stuff or tax or all that stuff, you know, just wears you down a little bit. So the advantages of selling it is that's now out of my life. I can just be a doctor and um, that's a bit of fun. And the other thing is for most practice owners, you feel the need, or you actually probably do need, to be there a lot, right? So you've probably not gone on four or six week European vacations because when you do, the practice income grinds down, but you still got to pay the staff wages, the rent and all these sorts of expenses. So one benefit of selling is that all those things that you wanted to do or would like to do, pursue a hobby, go on a holiday, study more, whatever it is, um, you now can do without having to worry about the stress of managing the overall finances of the practice. And ultimately it then allows you just to be a doctor focused on delivering clinical excellence. You know, just nice to be able to come to work and just be a doctor, not a doctor and plus, 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 plus. And for a lot of part, you know, you need to really consider you know, for most practices that we've looked at, they make money, but they don't make like lots and lots and lots of money. And then you have to really think about what's my time really worth? You know, if you were seeing patients, we would sort of expect that you should be able to bill 400 to 450 to $500 an hour. I doubt, you know, and even depending on whatever percentage you get paid, you're not getting paid that to run the business. I can guarantee you if you start looking at the numbers, um, that's basically how it would be. Now, I think the key thing for me is everyone's situation is very, very different. And um, I'm, look, I really am keen to help. I mean, hopefully for those who've known me over the last 20 years, um, I've been you know, very well, you know, generous and helpful in trying to help people navigate through the challenges of running a business. Um, so as far as setting up clinics, running clinics, optimizing them. 
but also conscious of helping people with relation to, to exiting. And so, you know, if you are interested in knowing what your practice is worth, you know, how I can make it more valuable, what my specific options are, because everybody's got a different timeline horizon, um, I'm very happy to help you with that process and, you know, give you two or three options. Um, I know a lot of people probably at the moment have been made offers to buy their practices and that's something which they're considering. I mean, I'd encourage you to have a chat first before you make any decisions because there are other options out there that might be better suited to what you're looking to do going forward. So um, there's my email address. Um, we are going to be sending out a copy of this recording. Um, I might actually just quickly re-record it because of that little uh, faux pas we had at the beginning. But what I'm just conscious of is um, if you would like to get in contact with me, very happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, because it is a very important consideration because it's not just about selling it and the money, it's about what happens afterwards, what are the terms and conditions. Um, and look, you know, my goal is, is for you to successfully move on if that's what you're doing into a place where you know, you're happy and, uh, and your staff and everybody else is happy uh, and going forward. So, um, and just finally, I mean, you know, our next event's on the Gold Coast in late June. I'll be there personally. So if you did want to speak to me personally, uh, but in the medium term, obviously very happy to take a phone call. And I do travel around to different parts of Australia. Very happy to meet you face to face. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you Paul. And if anyone's got any questions, Paul, it looks like you've been uh, you've managed to answer everything in your presentation so far. No questions. So we'll just uh, give everyone a couple of minutes to see if they did have anything uh, to oh, ask. In oh, the, oh, oh. Go. Yeah, sorry, guys. No, no, I was just going to say yeah. So whilst giving, I mean, apologise, probably should have let you know at the beginning. So uh, if there is the um, question box, so how do people put questions in, Hamish? Just let them know. Yep, so there's inside the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a range of different little lines. One says questions, there's a little drop down arrow next to it and you can just start typing in the question and click in send uh, and we will get that in, those questions. Wonderful. Um, whilst we're waiting to see if there's any questions, probably just share my experience is that, um, you know, back in the, you know, as you know, I was one of the early pioneers of developing skin cancer clinics, sort of started in 1999, 2000. Um, and as we were building our chain of clinics, we then had private equity approaches to, to, to look at it. We were, we were in the process of building out. We eventually built 14 clinics in four states. But um, private equity came in, offered us 60% for the company, promised us to deliver certain dollars. Um, basically what happened, they never delivered on those funds. They effectively pushed me out, um, which was a blessing in some respects because I was then able to set up HealthCert and, and help train and develop other doctors. But um, you know, eventually got pushed out and got nothing. And look, that's not everybody. I mean, look, everyone's experience is going to be different. I mean, for me, I actually went back and studied an MBA to make sure that wasn't going to happen to me again. Um, but I'm just conscious that, you know, it is very important. I went in, you know, naively believing everything that was being told. Turned out that wasn't the case. Um, and I think that, you know, if you are going to be doing, uh, looking at using your practice, as I said, do do your homework because, as I said, it, it is something which could potentially turn into a nightmare or a disaster. I mean, I chose to walk away from something I could have fought in court, to be honest, um, and you know, very happy that I did in the end because I was able to move on to a stress-free life and, and set up HealthCert. And I think we've now trained 10,000 doctors from 34 countries, so very happy that that was my next stage of my life. And then we decided back in 2009 to build um, uh, clinics, and since then we've acquired um, eight clinics around the country, um, which, you know, to sort of become part of that family. But I think the main thing for us was just more, you know, really get looking deeply into this. It's, as I said, it's, it's more than just is it money. It's really around, um, you know, what, what's going to happen next. All right. Looks like we do have a question. Thanks. Thank you. Let me just get my screen a bit bigger so I can... Actually, read it out. Oh, we've got two. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so one's uh, one's particularly relevant to today, Paul, which is relating to: Do you think the coronavirus will impact profitability and value of skin cancer clinics? Um, look, very good question. Um, look, the answer is no. Um, but, I mean, the risk is that for the coronavirus right now is that firstly, are patients going to cancel appointments because they've got a cold and they think that they've got the coronavirus? Are our staff going to get 
coughs and colds and not turn up for work, and also secondarily for our doctors. I mean, if a doctor gets sick, what do we do? Now, I mean, for our group of clinics, I'll, I'll share how we're trying to manage that at this point in time, is that we're putting you know, hand sanitizer, pump stations, ringing patients to say, if you have any flu-like symptoms, can we please book your appointment or shift your appointment and shifting it to 14 days later. Um, if any staff show any signs of illness, we're actually going to temperature test our staff as they come in, even though that's not an indicator, it really needs to be temperature and showing symptoms of, uh, we're not going to let them come to work. Now, as far as, look, if you were in a general practice, um, you know, you're going to be overwhelmed. I mean, I think we can all agree that over the next couple of months, it's going to be a lot of hysteria, a lot of patients who actually are going to have the flu thinking they've got the coronavirus. Um, I mean, as a pathology company, you'd be loving it because, of course, you know, all these tests are going to come from it. Uh, I don't think it's going to have any bearing on our practices. The risk that it has at the moment is patients cancel coming in to get their skin checked because they don't see it to be the most urgent or important thing in their life. Um, so, I mean, it's very early days. I mean, I know us as a group of practices, we're going to manage or so measure the no-show rate or cancellation rate. And what we will do is if we find, let's say, 5% of patients cancel, we'll then overbook by 5% going forward to allow for that. Um, the real risk is a doc, one of your doctors goes on holidays, it then becomes a place of you know, moderate or high risk and has to come back and then spend it 14 days in self-isolation and you lose all of that income. So look, we're in uncharted waters. Um, I'm actually thinking I might in a couple of weeks time do a webinar on how we've managed that uh, in our group of, you know, once again, of nine practices as skin cancer uh, as a skin cancer practice. I don't think it's going to affect the valuation. What normally happens with valuations, it's what your profit was last year, right? Take out all of your um, personal expenses. So in other words, let's say the practice made $100, but you had your personal car in there and a bunch of other things. So really it made 120 That's the number that's used to work out the value of the practice. So it wouldn't be what the coronavirus is going to do going forward. It would be what did I do in the last 12 months um, that makes the value of your practice. And that's the thing that we can also help you with because um, if it is really understanding what this thing is worth, it's actually not that difficult to calculate. Um, it's basically talking to your accountant, get a few numbers, back out a few things, um, and then that's very easy to do and we can definitely help you with that. Excellent, thank you. And we do have one more question. We might keep this as the last one as we're coming close to our time, but if anyone else has got another one, please. Get it in now. Uh, this question is, my practice manager wants to partial buy in to my general practice. Any experience with practice manager rather than doctors buying into a small general practice? Yeah, so look, um, I mean, look, that's, I mean, yeah, we've had seen this a number of times, so definitely familiar with this. And that was part of that management buyout option I was referring to earlier. Um, that typically is what I mean, management is the practice manager, right? And it could be either the practice manager only or a combination of practice managers or doctors. Now, depending on what your purpose is, right? Sometimes letting people buy into the practice makes it feel like it's theirs and they work a bit harder or, you know, once again, you know, squeeze the costs or, or try and improve the revenue um, could be one of the best outcomes or, you know, could be a good outcome. But I think that, look, the main thing really is, you know, what is your overall strategy? The danger of bringing somebody in as a part shareholder, right, is if you then want to make a decision to sell. Let's say, for example, you brought them in and they bought, let's say, 25% of the practice. Just use a number. So you go along three, four, five years later and you want to sell, right? Do they have to sell as well? So let's say someone came along and wants to buy the whole practice. The challenge is then is does the practice manager agree to sell, right, at the same price or whatever it is that you agree to? So. One of the risks by having minority shareholders, and depending on what's in the shareholders agreement, this is where once again, devil in the detail, is that they could stop your sale of your entire practice because they say, no, no, I want to hold out. I want more money. Uh, I don't want to sell now. There's all of these sorts of considerations. Now, you can write into your shareholders agreement that if, you know, once again, 75% or whatever the shareholding is, you know, if the decision is made, then everyone's got to follow it, right? So you can write shareholders agreement that if it's a majority or 60 or 70%, then everyone else has got no choice but to sell as well. Now also, if the company is looking to acquire your practice and they find out there's two shareholders that got to make the decision, um, that sometimes might make them wary about trying to buy it because they might do all this wonderful negotiation with you, get you over the line, get you to agree to a dollar, 
but then the other person says, no, nah, I'm not interested in selling or I want more money. So um, it is able to be done. I think that realistically is why does the practice manager want to buy in? And secondarily, why would you want to sell part of it? You know, for me, having minority shareholders is something you would generally would want to avoid because once you do that, even when they've got a little bit or a little bit more, they'll all have an opinion. And look, from my perspective, I generally like to, you know, be in a position that if we make a decision, that's the decision, right? Happy to listen to everybody, but I don't want someone else to then tell me how to do it or um, gazump me if it's something which I suppose is important. So um, in that situation, I would say, think about your motivation for you. I mean, yes, I'm sure there's lots of people that would like to buy a bit of your practice and, and get some of it. But I think the other thing to just be mindful of is what are you selling it for and what are you getting yourself into? And if you then want to exit later, are they going to exit at the same time? But if you want any help with that, once again, same thing, very happy to help. It really comes down to the structure of your shareholders agreement. Um, and, and you know, the, the key thing with this, and this is probably one of the final points, it's all about alignment, right? If you want to sit there and say, I have a three year plan to go from being practice owner to exit the practice and just work and then, you know, um, three or four years, then that is fine. Um, so I'm just conscious of the fact, you know, it's the same thing with your business partners. You, you, you may already be in a partnership with other people. You know, you need to be in a position that we all agree, this is what we want to do going forward and get them all on the same page because there's nothing worse than you want to go left and they want to go right. And then you basically fight each other to go through that process. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. That is our questions for today. So with that, I think it, uh, we'll call it a day. Um, this is the first of our business webinars for 2020. As Paul mentioned, uh, he's got uh, a number of different topics coming up, whether that be the coronavirus or some of the uh, other ones we've got planned for the rest of the year. Um, you'll also receive a recording of this uh, webinar via email and you're welcome to share it with colleagues. And as Paul's put there, his contact details. So please feel free to contact him. And uh, thank you, Paul, and look forward to hosting everyone in a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate the time.